Hello, everyone. Uh, please welcome James Wright in today's show. James is a change agent, author, enterprise agile coach, and business transformation leader. He has more than 20 plus years of experience in product development, seven plus as an agile coach, five plus year as an executive coach, public speaker, and trainer. He held VP position in Plan Ready, has worked with Lee Croy, I Omega Corporation, and Cisco. And he is a certified SAIS SAFE program consultant. So today we are going to talk about SAFE, which is Scale Agile Framework. So if you know nothing about SAFE, hopefully by the end of the show, you will learn everything about SAFE. So James, thank you for coming over. And before I talk about SAFE, I would like to talk about being executive coach. So can you talk something about executive coach, why someone needs an executive coach and how they help the organization or the executives? And usually when I worked with companies, they had built up their organization to a certain point and didn't know how to go beyond that. And so I came in and helped them to set up the new structures in the sales organization, uh, helped them to uh, take their marketing and make that for their next step to make them look bigger than they were. Um, and then helping them with their product roadmaps and stuff. Now I had a friend who's kind of a classic executive coach that came in and did things like help the uh, boards of directors learn how to talk to each other mm. or to the CEO to help him uh, work with his vice presidents to resolve their differences. Um, there are a lot of companies out there that look really uh, great, but behind the scenes are uh, three or four people that hate each other. Um, uh -huh. And he would come in there and help them to remember that they really liked each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't get into that too much. I helped them with the how do we how do they work with the rest of the company, not uh, so much with the executive staff. Um, mm -hmm. I had done some of that work, but uh, I found out that I liked being much more on the business side than on the uh, babysitter side. Okay. Okay. So when you say you would like to be on the business side, in what sense, like setting the strategy with executives? So Things yeah, like so that. I helped them set up their strategy. I helped them implement the strategy, both on the sales and on the marketing fluffy areas and also on the hard part of the company too. Okay, okay. So let's uh, jump right in into SAFE. So let's start with what is SAFE? Well, SAFE is uh, what we call an agile methodology or agile framework. Agile is a set of principles on how to think and act. It's a mindset. Um, it's built on the foundation of lean um, and safe is a prescriptive set of processes and policies on how to take those principles and apply them into doing things. There are several other frameworks out there. There's scrum at scale, um, less, um, there's DAD, several of them out there. Um, some of them have more structure, some of them have less, uh, and SAFE has a lot. Hmm, right. So yeah, SAFE is like scale agile framework and looks like they are taking the agile framework beyond just the dev team and having a scrum and Kanban. They are taking it to the whole organization as such. And uh, what I wonder is uh, when you are stepping beyond the dev art, like I'm a CTO in my day job, and I know how we are using the agile framework and their philosophies and principles and practices in my dev team. But going beyond that, like going towards the product development, going towards the sale and HR, and bringing everybody in agile journey, that seems like pretty daunting tasks and, and can you talk a little bit about your experiences where you went in some organization and took SAFE all across the organization? Yeah, so that's actually my specialty is working in non-software areas of the company using Agile. Mm -hmm. um, now, I know a lot of SAFE talks about how they can uh, are applied to non-IT uh, areas. But if you look at SAFE today, they are still very IT-centric. So even when they talk about working with sales and HR and finance, it's really helping those people deal with software and IT. 
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so they have some, they, they're they trying to expand out, but I have never seen safe used in its entirety outside of the IT area. Mm. Now I know they have some case studies that that's been, that's, that it's out there, but I haven't ever seen it in the real world. Okay. Uh, I've seen agile used outside of, uh, outside of IT and software, mm-hmm. uh, but I haven't mm-hmm. seen safe implemented fully outside. Okay. Um, I think they still are trying to gather the information and get the experience to do that better. Right, right. Because I see to even for safe to be successful, uh, you have to have the all executives to be trained into safe and they have to buy in in the whole idea of safe because uh, when you implement safe in any organization, you start on the top by setting the strategy and then setting the portfolio vision and then the value streams and all. So have you had any experience where uh, in in that segment of safe where you are trying to change the executive, uh, you have any, you know, you found any resistance or it's easy to convince them to, to go the safe way, uh, any anything which you can share with our audience in yeah, there, there, the real world. Yeah, there are two ways where, two things that get companies to make a commitment for transformation, right? The first thing would be like a huge crisis. Mm. Um, in fact, a, lot of, a lot of people out there say, if you don't have a crisis, create one. Um, I, I don't recommend that because... Mm. Part of Agile is having trust. And if your people find out that you're just faking it, then uh, you're not going to do too good going forward. True. Um, the second way is to have really good leadership to see that the organization can be better or it needs to be better. Um, my experience is uh, in the people, the clients that I've worked with is much more on the leadership side. Um, I've worked in companies that have had a crisis. In fact, my very first experience really in an agile environment was in a company where basically said transform or we're going to die. Mm. Um, and so 2000 people were very motivated to change the way they did things. Mm. Um, but uh, most recently in the last uh, seven years or so, most of my clients uh, it's because they had a leader that saw that they could do something a whole lot better and they mm. needed to do things differently to do things better. And that's how they got started. And yeah, mm-hmm. starting at the top is always the best way to go. Um, sure. Now, officially SAFE says you start at the top on the training, but then you go to the teams and you start to get the team set up and before you move to the portfolio. Now I would alter that and say, it's always best in my opinion, to start at the top, move to the portfolio, then move down to the teams because then you have the link between the leadership and the people doing the work. True, true. And I think leadership has to be completely bought in because uh, these are expensive uh, ceremonies as such, expensive cadence uh, when you are setting up the vision and portfolio, et cetera, and value stream. It's not, you know, a couple of hours thing. It, it's, it's a process and where a lot of people are involved. And if executives will not buy in, things will not fly, I believe. Yeah, well, the, the primary thing here is that this is not, if you set it up as additional work to be done for the company, you're going to fail because people don't have time to do their normal job plus agile stuff. True. You have to integrate it into the core function of the company. And so you have to start with what are the company's, you know, what's the company's mission? What are their goals or objectives? And that goes for the whole everything. And then you talk about when you implement it going into it, the portfolio is how they manage the work being done. And you talk to the executive leadership and say, whatever we put into the portfolio is what you're doing. You're not allowed to do anything else. Mm. And then they realize they're jumping all the way in. You can't, uh, you know, when you go swimming, it's always best to jump in and get wet. Um, The most uncomfortable place is to sit on the edge of the pool, especially in Seattle. If you go to a pool and you sit on the edge of the pool with your feet dangling into the water, you're going to be cold, right? It'll be very uncomfortable. It's best to either stay in the house or go all the way in the water and start swimming. Right. So to have a transformation be successful, you got to get them all the way in and get them moving so that they are prioritizing their real work. There's not a separate set of books of other work being done somewhere else. 
mm-hmm. and that uh, you, you're using the uh, the principles and the policies to run the entire business or entire portion of the business. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing to the side. As long as you think of it as this is our job and we're doing agile, just help us with some things. As long as it's sort of side by side, it's going to fail. You have to have it all together. True, true. So another thing I noticed in SAFE, they recommend uh, changing the uh, PMO office also, program management office, making it an agile PMO and the way they are doing the funding and budgeting and setting up the guardrail and and, and funding uh, just the value streams and not the project. Uh, would you like to talk a little bit about that? If you have an experience where you try to change the PMO office and the way they do things, because I feel uh, that's a pretty big change for, for PMOs. Yeah, my, my uh, philosophy is a little bit radical. I think PMOs should be killed. Huh. All right. If you have any kind of accountability that's separate from management, you're going to have problems. Mm. And so you need to take the accountability for the execution and the success of the work in a company and tie it to the people who are making the decisions. If you try to give it to anybody else outside of that chain of command, it's going to cause problems or at the very best, it's going to cause 20%, 50% more meeting time. Uh. Interesting, very interesting. And so you take the people who are accountable and you put them into the chain of command and make them also responsible for doing the work. True, true. Make make a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, James, I do. Mind? So I'll give I'll give you a quick example. I know sure. of a company from Silicon Valley that tried an agile transformation about uh, six years ago. Mm. In doing so, they made their PMO much stronger, and that was the reason why they're account of their uh, transformation failed. I've done a lot of research on looking through all of their public rec- all their public filings. I estimate that the cost to them of having a failed transformation was at a billion dollars. Wow. wow. And they went and they lost a couple of notches in market leadership also. True. Right. The accountability has to be with the executives and the people that report to them. They can't put it off to the side and say those people are account those people are responsible for making our company biz- uh, successful if you mm. do that you're doomed right right and and you said this is uh, mainly because of having a very stronger pmo office which is separate from the people who are doing the real work yeah so there's there's an old adage that says something like uh, the number one priority of a bureaucracy is to perpetuate the bureaucracy Right. Mm. And if you have a, P, a PMO that has a lot of power, they'll work at getting more powerful. Right. And in Agile, the whole idea is to take the power and distribute it out as far as you can. True, true. De- decentralize. Yes. And so if you create something in the middle, you're killing yourself. Killing yourself. Yeah. Very, very good insight. So that, that brings me uh, to my next question. As you know, in my day job, I work with U.S. government, with NIH. So do you have any experience bringing SAFE in, in a government organization and how different the government is from you know, a regular enterprise or a private enterprise? Yeah, the biggest issues are dealing with um, all that bureaucracy, right? The budgeting especially, mm. the way the budgets get reviewed, mm. and it has to do with the way they set up the goals and the the uh, the their um, OKRs. OKRs, and, right? And it's still, it, and it is still a yearly process of budgeting, right? And it's still a yearly process. But then you have projects that are multi-year projects, and they set the project in like 2015, right? And it doesn't get approved until fiscal 2017, right? And then the work starts sometime in 2018. And now you're trying to evaluate work done in 2018. That's at the beginning of the project against things that were defined way back in 2015, All right? 2015 mm-hmm. you had a different administration. The world was different back then. And now you're using old, old stuff to evaluate progress. And if it's a five-year project, then that means in 2023, you're still using specs from way back in 2015. Right. Well, that's not very agile at all. And so right. a lot of the work in the government has to do with dealing with budgets 
and dealing with evaluations, hmm. right? You try to get the evaluations written in such a way that they're tied to real world outcomes right. without having any, pers- with very little prescriptive detail about how those outcomes are accomplished. Hmm. Hmm. All right. So if you have a new database technology or a new encryption that comes around or a new whatever, you can implement that without having without it breaking the original specs. Right. right. Those are the challenges that you have you run into in in, in uh, agile and government. And these are big challenges. Uh, I don't know how easy it is to change the PMO office and the yearly budget planning things like that. No, it's we have to start at the very beginning when you're writing the proposal for the projects. Ah, yes. That's the trick. True. I agree. Completely agree with you. And you also have to work with the internal auditor to help him understand what those specifications are and how to evaluate it. So that when he or she comes around to see if you're keeping up your end of the contract, you can say, we're delivering this outcome and here's our progress to it. Right, Right. 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 So I want to double click on this thing because that's a very interesting thing you said. Uh, before we'll go any further about uh, when you're bringing safe, you will write it in, the, you'll start with the proposal. In fact, I was working with my proposal team yesterday and explaining them all the you know, principles of safe. So can you talk a little bit about uh, that particular aspect of proposal writing for government and bringing the safe? So what are the things you will, you will uh, bring in into the proposal? Well, again, you you want to you want to write it much more upon the outcome you're trying to achieve, without talking about the means of achieving it. Right? Mm. You need to so that gives you the flexibility along the way to experiment and to learn and to do better. Now, right. I am not going to say that I'm a, an expert on writing proposals. Um, there are several really good uh, pieces of of, uh, of resources on the safe website that help people do that kind of stuff. Right. And I would also say that there are a lot of people out there in government sector that are doing agile today, whether safe or not safe. Hmm. And uh, if you're putting together a proposal, try to find one of those people to help you out because they have really good um, detailed experience. They can give you about how they passed or how they failed inspections. Right. 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 All right. Now it's everywhere, right? Agile started into government in the early parts of the last decade by 2015 it was making pretty good inroads Hmm. um you know i've seen it every year now it's it's very strong and kind of like the periphery so like at fannie mae and freddie mac agile's all they do with their software Hmm. work all right in other places that are on the periphery it's very very strong as you get into the deep into the government you know proper it's also making inroads Uh, so for example i i'm talking to uh government agency, uh, well, not right now because they're kind of gone for the holiday, but uh, I'll be talking to them the very first week of January again, and they're in the process of starting a transformation, and they're running into some issues because of, you know, they all do, right. uh, but it's, it's, it's getting everywhere, so right. the big problem is the, you don't do safe just to do safe, that's not a that's not really a good goal. True. You do safe because it's a tool to get you something else. Exactly. And so whenever you're doing a, an agile transformation, you should be asking yourself, why are we doing it? What do we expect to get out of it? Mm-hmm. And then measuring yourself against those goals also. Yes, perfect. Yeah, yeah, very right. So um, now it's maybe easier question than, than the government, <laughs> changing the government organizations. Is um, Suppose, James, you are invited to a company we just started and, you know, I have a friend who is starting a company. They just got the funding and everything. And if you, and uh, so it's not a very small company, let's say they have maybe say 50 dev or so to start it with. And if you step in, in that company, what all few things, first few steps you will take to make sure that the company, uh, you know, get a good start on the safe uh, itself. So if you can talk about few of the initiative you will start with. Well, if they want to do safe specifically, I would tell them to focus on the essential safe. And don't essential look at anything safe. else. Yes. The, you know, the, in fact, I might advise them not to do safe if they're a small startup. True. Because 
safe are for companies that are established that need to have help to do stuff right. right. A small startup is nice and fresh and hasn't done anything wrong yet. Mm. And so I would just teach them pure, lean, and agile. I would tell them to read the Lean Startup right. book and tell and teach them a really basic course on agile principles mm-hmm. and very simple stuff about Kanban and Scrum. And then I would work with the leadership to make sure they define their mission and objectives and how to communicate that out and how to use metrics to measure uh, progress towards those objectives. Mm. And then I let them just start and without right. all the extra structure that SAFE or other frameworks would provide. A small startup um, doesn't need too much help. Right, right. So, uh, yeah, they do have a concept of essential SAFE. And I think you're right that just start with the essential SAFE, take their best practices and, and move on. Because I do see when SAFE, uh, they talk about, they do talk about team, agility, the product management, all those things. And they are, I think, good practices. So if from get go, you will start following that, it will be easier for you when you'll grow to, to continue on those processes as such. Yeah, the, the, For a larger company, one of the biggest values of SAFE and other methodologies is it helps companies to get more customer centric. But if you're right. a startup, most people in the company can pull out their hands and toes and count how many customers they have and tell you their right. names. And right. so they're already customer centric. I mean, the, the thing you want to do is make sure that you don't give them too much structure that it, it, it defocuses, that defocuses them from their customer. And right. that's why you need to make sure you don't give them too much Yes, yes. And, and you are right. You know, generally companies start with the customer focus of what we talk about in SAFE is the network effect. And as we start growing, that's the time we start focusing on other things other than the customer. And then that's why we start having this uh, a hierarchy for organization and, and dual operating system, what SAFE talks about and all those problems yeah, start so, showing up. So for example, in SAFE, there's this concept of the lace, right? Right. put together a committee that's in charge of the implementation. Well, I wouldn't put together a committee in a startup. I would say you're to the CEO, you're the head of the lace. Yes. You know, your executive staff, that is the lace. You don't true. create anything new. True, true, true. Agreed with you. So uh, people who are listening and don't know what is lace, lace is lean, agile, uh, uh, COE, center of excellence. No, lace, L-A-C-E. Yeah, center of excellence. Lean Agile Center of Excellence. Yeah, yeah, good point. Uh, so James, I see there are a lot of uh, YouTube videos out there where they talk about why SAFE fails. So can you talk about a couple of uh, points or reasons why SAFE fail in organizations? Yeah, I, I've seen lists as long as 10 reasons, mm-hmm. um, but I'll boil them down to just two. Um, the first one is, uh, bad management, bad leadership. And that goes everything from the leadership isn't fully committed to um, the leadership not wanting to be a part of it. You know, they say, you guys implement this. I don't want to be part of it. Get better. Right. Um, I see that in all different varieties, uh, almost everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, now, as a consultant, they don't bring me into companies that are doing great. I go to places where they have problems. True. True. All right. True. The other the other big problem um, that I've seen is that people get so caught up in the in the structure of the framework and the policies and the meetings and the roles, they don't really think about the work and the customer. Mm-hmm. So leadership and focus are the two big issues that I've seen out there. Two big issues. Okay. Okay. So James, you have heard about uh, discipline agile delivery (DAD). Mm-hmm. And then I have the safe. So I understand. So uh, what is the difference between these two? When we should use one over another? Uh, so if you can talk a little bit about it. Well, DAD is um, actually kind of similar to safe. If you uh, look at them and squint your eyes a little bit, mm-hmm. um, it's it's actually much more focused on IT than safe is, which okay. I thought was impossible to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it goes much more into the um, processes, um, mm-hmm. 
It's Lots a toolkit lo- more than a framework, I guess. DAD. Well, it, uh, you could you could call it a framework. It's just in some areas, it's just much more intricate. Right. Lots and lots of uh, flow charts. Um, the problem that I have with implementing things that are that detailed is the you know the the word agile means flexible, and then right. you take a framework that has lots and lots of must do processes and must have roles and must have meetings and pretty soon it's not flexible anymore. True, true, true. Yeah. You know, every so, company uh, is different. So hopefully when you implement whatever you decide is closest to what you need, you should feel the freedom to do customization to make it fit your needs best. Right. Right. There are no agile police that will put you in agile jail if you break any of the rules. Right. Yes. True. Um, so my next question is, um, have you heard any worst management advice, which you thought like, no, this is not good. And, and you were given that advice when you were young. And then with the experience, you realize, man, that's not a good advice. Well, uh, I'll tell you two really quick. Mm-hmm. Um, the first one um, wasn't a philosophy. It was a very, something very specific. I went into a new company as a junior executive and and uh, my boss told me uh, which people in the company I could trust and which people I couldn't. And what I found mm. out was that you should never trust that kind of advice, mm. that you should treat everybody as individuals and try to learn on your own um, who has what capabilities and who's trustworthy and not. It turned out in that particular instance, um, all of his recommendations were almost completely opposite of reality. Uh, all right. The, uh, the other piece of really, so that, was, that wasn't so much business advice as it was personal advice, but business advice wise, I once had a CEO who had a uh, philosophy that he called constructive conflict, which is he liked his executives to argue with each other. Mm. Uh, mm. And that was more for entertainment purpose for him, I decided, <laughs> than it was to uh, make the company better. Right. Um, I allowed myself to... Uh, dive into it once with his backing and his urging. Then later I decided, and I got what I needed, but then I decided, but sure, I got what I needed, but now I, that man hates me. Uh, He's not going to collaborate with me on his own. He's only going to do things for me to scare him. And, you know, afterwards I felt horrible about it. Uh, Okay. So, and now let's talk about the flip side the best management advice you got or you'd like to give? Well, the best management advice I got um, that I can say uh, in a very quick soundbite is this, because uh, if you have an ugly baby, make sure you kill it before your competitors do. Oh my God. (laughs) That's a good advice. If we are talking about the product, yes. You're talking about the product, the way that you look at the market, right? If it's, a lot of parents feel like their baby can do no wrong. It's the most beautiful baby in the world. Yeah. Um, it's a tough love. Very good advice, I think. Yes. And the companies that kill off their babies are the companies that do great. Right, right. And I think Google does it most often. We see so many products get killed more than they start to kill the products. I think it's a good thing. True. Well, the, the example I use in, the, in my latest book is uh, Nokia. Right. Ah. They were... 38% market share. They thought they were awesome. Um, now they have 0% market share. Right, right. About Nokia, they were the number one oh, once yeah. upon a time. Number one. And billion people were using their devices. And now, now they, they get had, restructured, though. They had more market share than their next three competitors combined. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, good, good uh, learning business case study, Nokia, Blockbuster, uh, Kodak. These are the companies can teach us a lot. So uh, you were talking about uh, your, you wrote two books. Uh, can you talk quickly about uh, um, the one which is you writing? I see you're talking about 10x improvement. Uh, I, I know it's not published yet, but it is in process. Yeah, so I, I, um, I'm typesetting it right now. Mm-hmm. I did run into a little bit of a hiccup because uh, 
uh, my largest chapter, I had decided I had to uh, reorganize it to make it flow a little bit better. So okay. that's that's today. Uh, okay. Proofreading and, and rewriting is not fun. Um, <laughs> so I had hoped, so it looks like it'll be the first week of January when it'll be published. It's called Agile Principles for Business. Um, and it's all about how to do 10 times better, right? Most, most agile people say things like improve productivity by 15% or mm. improve quality by 50%, things like that. But you can improve things like that just by being a really good micromanager. And agile right. provides up to do a whole lot better. Mm. Uh, and that's, I'm going to a lot of case studies to show how to do that. Um, and so that'll be out soon. And my other book is called Scrum Marketing. That was from back in 2014. Hmm. It's a really small kind of booklet just to talk about how you can implement Agile into non-technical areas, how it would operate, and how you can flex flexibly implement it to meet your needs. It's, right. it's, it's basically out there to help people not to make a big mistake. Hmm. And it is focused uh, mostly towards the marketing department? That's right. Okay. Okay, so can you give me one or two points when we are say running a marketing for a product? Uh, what are the top three things we should uh, keep a you know eye on, and, and make it very agile way to run the campaign? Well, uh, the first one I would say is validated learning, right? Mm. Um, I did a lot of work uh, helping companies with their digital marketing, and I was I've never seen stats used properly yet. And so they would have like an A-B test between one landing page and a different landing page to see which one performed better. And they would just look at the raw numbers. And so I'd ask, well, have you done an ANOVA test to see if it actually is significantly different or not? You mm. know, nobody has actually done something that takes maybe 15 minutes to do. Mm. So they're making decisions on million dollar campaigns using third grade math. <laughs> they should do, you know, college grade math. True, um, true. Also, they have an issue of talking with, uh, with each other. So in like a large company, you'll find groups in one part of it that learn something and the other part way over here doesn't know about that. And so they spend hours and hours, well, more like weeks and weeks trying to do something that somebody else already knows and has learned. Mm -hmm. And then if one or two people from that group leave, then that knowledge disappears with them. Right, right, right. Now, but all of but all of the agile principles like collaboration and prioritization are all the kinds of things that these guys need. True, true. So now, when we are on topic of books, I would like to um, you know get any uh, name of books which really affected you in your life, or you will recommend those books to anybody you know starting their career. Well. There are a lot of books out there. And if I start naming too many books, it'll get turned into a long list. Mm -hmm. um, I would say start with these three, which uh, may not be classic agile books. So I would start with Start With Why by Simon Sinek. Okay. Because yeah. if you're going to set up your priorities, you have to know why you're doing it before you can set up the what's and right. the how's. Mm -hmm. All right. I look at uh, Lean Startup by mm -hmm. Reese. Now, that's an old book that talks specifically about startups. And in some cases, he's a little extreme about, uh, about a few things, but it gets you the idea of the whole idea of the iteration process and talking to your customers. Mm -hmm. Then I look at the, the lean books by Womack mm -hmm. to help you understand how you should uh, try to eliminate waste from your processes. And right. if you have that foundation of those three things and the agile books that you read, you can put them in uh, context of, Will they help me achieve what I'm trying to accomplish, what my purpose is? Will they get rid of the waste that I have? Will they help me focus on my customer more? Right? Right, right. Good, thank you. So the this thing is it, the last question. Uh, no, just, but let me, let me interrupt just with one sure, thing, is that sure. the principles in Agile have been around forever, right? Mm. You can't invent a principle. You can only discover them. True. And you can't ignore them. I guess you can't ignore them. They just will beat you against the head by doing so. Yes. And so most of the really good agile information are from non-agile sources. Hmm. Like my favorite agilist is uh, Kanoshigi Matsushita, who, fought, who founded the company most people know of as Panasonic. Mm -hmm. He did that way back in 1917 before, you know, what, about 90 years before agile, that word is even used. Right. Right. But you can look and see the things that he did, and those were agile things. 
Right, right. Very good. So, uh, James, uh, this is the last question uh, I ask all my guests to talk about their failures. And the idea here is uh, everybody, you know, I'm talking to, they are pretty accomplished. But when you see from outside, it looks like a straight line. They're just going up. But in real life, it doesn't happen. It's up and down. And, and that's how the life is. And I want people who are listening, they should get inspired that failure is just a temporary stop in life. So I would like to know uh, if any experience you can share in your of your life where you fail, it can be professionally, personally, and then how you came out of it and what did you learn out of your failures? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about two. Sure. Um, the first... Um, I failed at it two or three times before I learned the lesson. Um, and the problem was that uh, I'm, I try to be, I try to be kind of apolitical, right? The, the goal is on taking care of customers. The goal is on, you know, the success for the company. Uh, I wasn't trying to build a reputation or get internal praise, hmm. right? Hmm. Um, I received it, but I, I didn't try to create that. Now, the mistake was that the praise didn't go all toward me. The praise came to my, my team, and I didn't seek that. And so because I didn't seek the getting the credit for my team, kind of the, uh, the effect was something I didn't anticipate, which meant that everybody attributed everything to just me. And mm. so my team didn't get any credit for the work that they did. And it seems kind of counterintuitive, but if you don't seek the glory, then you only get it for yourself. And so okay. my advice is get the credit for your team so they can all share in it and use that to do things in the future. Otherwise, mm. the leader gets all of the recognition and everybody else gets nothing. True, true. Yeah. And it really uh, prevents them from having the ability to do more in the future. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the second thing I would say for those that are in leadership, uh, I made a very big mistake once. The company was, uh, uh, you know, uh, there were divisions and uh, the CEO was making rumblings that he was going to retire in a few years. Well, I found my I found myself unemployed a little shortly a little bit after that, and if, the reason was because I was part of the succession battle, but I didn't realize that I was part of that war. Uh, you know, and if you don't know that you're part of a war, you're going to lose. Yes. And so, <laughs> it kind of it's it's similar to the the other mistake, right? Because right. I was so focused on the business requirements, I tried to stay away from the politics. Mm -hmm. And this one got me. And so mm -hmm. what I want to give advice is that you may not care about those things, but you need to stay aware of them. All right. Stay I wouldn't say yes. don't start rumors. Don't try to, uh, you know, to turn the workplace into a political machine. But if that stuff is going on, you need to know about it so it doesn't hurt you. True. True. I think it's very good advice. Very good. Yeah. So with this, uh, thank you, James. Thank you very much for your time. I hope our listeners have learned something about SAFE. So thank you very much. Thanks for having me.